Good day. We are going to talk about the motion of satellites. Here is an example of a satellite orbiting around Earth. And we are going to primarily ask the two questions. How do satellites stay in orbit? And what determines the properties of their orbits? In order to understand orbits, we have to go back to our lesson in projectile motion. Recall that in projectile motion, there are two kinds, the horizontally launched projectiles and the projectiles launched at an angle. To understand orbits, we need to recall projectiles launched at an angle. In this case, there's a car. It has an initial horizontal velocity, VI, and because of gravity, it's not going to move straight forward. Instead, it's going to follow a parabolic path. And when we look at this path, it seems like it's a complicated mathematical shape. And it's no longer linear like the ones we had with one-dimensional kinematic equations. But as it turns out, we don't have to deal with this kind of shape in a two-dimensional way, we just have to break it down into two one-dimensional analysis. In other words, projectile motion is a combination of horizontal motion and vertical motion. So these are two one-dimensional motions that we combine so that we can analyze projectile motion. The vertical motion of the projected object is independent of its horizontal motion. So you can treat both horizontal motion and vertical motion as two independent problems and each has nothing to do with the other. The horizontal motion is in fact when you plot the Vx versus time it looks like a straight horizontal line with no slope. So in other words, the slope of this graph is zero. And that means that along the horizontal, our projectile has no acceleration. So it's going to move at constant velocity. So try to imagine this car is moving at constant velocity forward if we forget gravity for a moment. So recall that for a velocity versus time graph, the area under the graph is just the displacement of that object. So in this case, the horizontal line makes a wonderful rectangle with a t-axis. So to calculate the area is as simple as length times width. So to get the displacement, it's as simple as getting the velocity x and the time and multiplying the two. So we have delta x is equal to vx times time. Now, in order to fully solve for the projectile, we have to combine this horizontal motion with a vertical motion. So this is what the vertical motion looks like. Here we are treating all download, downward motion as negative. The slope of this graph is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And since slope is rise over run, we can see here that our slope g is equal to negative vy over t, where negative vy is our rise, or actually our fall, because it's a negative slope, and our run is t. From this definition of slope, we get an important relationship, vy is equal to negative gt. Now, the area of this graph is this, it forms the shape of a triangle. So the area of a triangle is one half base times height. 
So here we have 1 half Vy times t. But our Vy, of course, is negative gt, the result we got earlier. Combining that with this equation that we got for the displacement, we now have another wonderful equation for the displacement. In this case, the vertical displacement, negative 1 half gt squared. So at the same time that this car or this projectile is horizontally displaced, as uh, we mentioned in the previous slide, it is also vertically displaced. What happens is it looks like that. It is moving forward, but at the same time it is falling thanks to gravity. One proof that the horizontal and the vertical motions are independent is if you have another car here and it falls straight down with no horizontal velocity at all. And if they move at the same time, so this new car falls at the same time that this old car falls off the cliff, they will actually hit the ground at the same time. You can try that. Uh, you have a piece of paper and another piece of paper and you drop one piece of paper from the same height as you throw the other piece of paper vertically forward, I mean horizontally forward. You will find that most piece of papers drop at the same time. And also I'm going to show to you this um, FET simulation. And I want you to carefully look at the velocity vectors, namely the horizontal and the vertical velocity vectors. I hope you notice that. Let's focus on the horizontal velocity vector. Look at that. It's not changing, right? So there is no acceleration for the horizontal velocity vector. But for the vertical velocity vector, it's growing, right? It's getting bigger and bigger. See? And the rate of change of growth of this velocity is determined by the vertical acceleration, which is constant in this case, 9.8. As you can see, our acceleration vector is constant, 9.8 meters per second squared downward. Let's combine the two and see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope you see now um, the difference between the vertical and the horizontal velocity vectors. Let's go back. Let's look at an example. The car of mass 500 kilograms is launched horizontally from a cliff 50 meters high. What is the horizontal displacement of the car if its initial velocity is 10 meters per second, 20 meters per second? So the horizontal displacement is given by this formula where our Vx is just equal to Vi. So for letter A, that's 10 meters per second because it doesn't change. Our horizontal velocity doesn't change. But we don't know the time. We don't know the time it takes for when the car hits the ground somewhere here. So we got to find the time somewhere. And um, we, do, we can use this formula to find the time because our vertical displacement is given. Our gravitational acceleration is just 9.8 and by man manipulating um, our time is actually um, negative 2 square root of y square root of negative 2 square root y over g so we now have a formula for calculating the horizontal displacement and maybe you're wondering why the negative sign is in the square root well, don't worry because that negative sign will disappear once we substitute delta y. g here is positive 9.8 because it's just the value of the gravitational acceleration. Delta y 
is going to be negative because it's going to be negative 50 meters because the displacement is downward the vertical displacement is downward so don't worry about the negative sign that will disappear so you can answer that in your notebook here are our assumptions though for solving projectile motion number one there's no air resistance because that will highly complicate the path of our projectile number two projectile is launched near the earth's surface as a consequence the gravitational acceleration is constant makes our life easier as well and number four the earth is flat that's the biggest assumption because from our perspective the earth is flat and we really can see the curvature of the earth but what happens if we launch a projectile with such strong speeds and from such a great height that we can no longer neglect the curvature of the earth this is highly exaggerated and probably impossible but I'm just trying to make a point in this case the projectile is still affected by acceleration due to gravity and the faster the initial horizontal velocity the farther its displacement along the surface of the earth is and with the right velocity the projectile will continue to fall but will never hit the ground so why is that so if I launch this projectile with this kind of initial velocity it will probably fall right over here so notice that the curvature of the earth plays a significant role in the horizontal displacement what if we increase the velocity it will still be affected by gravity but this time it will travel a much farther distance what if we increase the velocity again it will probably travel a bit further imagine a kind of velocity so strong that it will as it falls okay that's not enough it will still fall right here but at least it's traversed almost a quarter of the circumference of the earth but imagine throwing the ball so strongly and with such great speed okay that's not even good enough trying to do it such strong speed that <laughs> I butchered it here that it will never touch the ground it will continue to fall but it will never touch the ground anything faster than that speed will probably cause this object to travel so with such a high orbit that it will not go back to earth so there is a certain velocity that will make this projectile fall and now we can call it a satellite it will continue to fall but it will never hit the earth's surface this is some illustration based on a book by isaac newton called the principia objects orbiting around the celestial body are constantly falling but they just never hit the surface look at path one and path two and path three four and five these are what you call closed orbits path six and seven are open orbits and um, path one and two are just the velocity the initial velocities are not just strong enough and they hit the earth three four and five are ideal to complete an orbit around the earth what is an orbit an orbit is a regular repeating path that one object in space takes around another one all objects are actually elliptical because the circle is uh, it's a special kind of ellipse it's an ellipse where the focuses the fo focuses of its focuses are located in the center so on top of one on top of the other planets actually have an almost circular orbit and the comets have highly eccentric orbit so what do i mean by eccentric well let's talk about eccentricity of an ellipse the eccentricity of an ellipse is given by E equals C over A, where C is the distance from the center to one of the foci, 
and A is a distance from the center to uh, one of the vertices of the ellipse. And here, when we try to measure here, uh, it is 3.7 over 5, our C is 3.7 and our A is 5, we get an eccentricity of 0.74. As you can see, this is what an ellipse with an eccentricity of 0.74 looks like. That's a pretty high eccentricity and that is um, the eccentricity of um, a comet. The sun here is located in one of the foci. So you can say that the sun is right here. Right, that's the sun. Now I mentioned that planets have a very small eccentricity. What? Let's see what this an ellipse with a small eccentricity looks like. See, it looks like a circle. Here, the eccentricity of this um, ellipse is 0.6 over 3.4. Remember, this is our C and our A is from the center to the vertex, from one of the vertices, and that is 0.18. So, the closer the focus is to the center, the smaller the eccentricity. So, 0.18 is a small eccentricity. Um, the smaller the eccentricity, the, the more circular the ellipse looks like. And a circle has an eccentricity of zero. So given this in mind, let's look at the eccentricities of planets. Look at Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The eccentricities of these planets are so small, especially Venus, 0.007. So you can say that their orbits are almost circular, but it took the genius of a certain Johannes Kepler to figure out by analyzing Tycho Brahe's data that these orbits are not circular but are in fact ellipses. So for circular orbits, so it is... Um, Therefore, it is practical to analyze planets moving around the sun as being circular orbits. So it's a good approximation. That's why um, we are going to be analyzing the circular orbits of satellites and planets and using the mathematics of circular orbits and the physics of these orbits for our calculations because it's a good approximation. The only force acting on a satellite in circular orbit is the gravitational force. There's no other force acting on that satellite except the gravitational force. Without the gravitational force, the satellite's inertia will cause it to move in a straight line. So the purpose of that gravitational force is not to make the satellite fall towards the Earth, but to make it fall around the Earth. That force will only contribute to a change in velocity, but not the, a change in the magnitude of the velocity, but a change in the direction of the velocity. This force will cause the satellite to constantly change its velocity. Thus, this force is also known as a centripetal force. And because there's only this centripetal gravitational force acting on the satellite, we can say that the satellite is moving in uniform circular motion. And it has an orbital speed that is constant. So I mentioned earlier centripetal force. Centripetal force is not a new force, it is a requirement force. It is required for objects to move in uniform circular motion. For satellites in circular orbit, the centripetal force is a gravitational force. There um, is a formula for centripetal force in relation to the orbital speed or the speed around the circular path. Here, mv squared over r, m is the mass of the satellite, v is the orbital velocity of the satellite, and r is the orbital radius of the satellite. In general, though, V is just the speed 
around the circular path and r is the radius of that circular path and m is the mass of the object moving around that path. We also know from Newton's second law that any force will cause an object to accelerate. And for the case of centripetal force, we have centripetal acceleration. The second line, Fc equals mac, is derived from Newton's second law. Summation of all forces is equal to mass times acceleration. But here, there's only one force acting on the satellite. So the sum is just that one force. And that force happens to be a centripetal force. So that corresponds to a centripetal acceleration, which we can, if we combine equation 1 and equation 2, we will arrive at this also useful formula for the centripetal acceleration. Even if the satellite has a constant orbital velocity, it still has a centripetal acceleration. We often associate acceleration with changes in speed, getting faster or getting slower, but here the velocity still changes, but it is not the magnitude that changes, it is the velocity direction that changes. At each point in its path, the direction of the velocity changes. That is still a change in velocity. We combine the formula for universal gravitation with this centripetal force formula, and we get, by combining both mv squared over r is equal to gme m over r squared, and we have v squared is equal to gme over r, square root both sides, we get this formula for the orbital speed of a satellite around Earth, very useful formula, where g here is the gravitational constant, m e is the mass of the Earth, 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, and r is the radius of orbit measured from the center of the Earth. Another important formula is the period. Period is just the time it takes to complete one orbit. So now, if you look at this formula, this has to make sense because since the speed of the satellite is constant, this constant speed is equal to the average speed. Recall that the formula for the average speed is total distance over total time. For one orbit, the total distance traveled by this um, satellite is 2 pi r, which is the circumference of the circle of the orbit. And the total time is just what we call the period, which is the time it takes to complete one full 2 pi r, or one full orbit around the planet. So this formula makes sense, 2 pi r over t. Rearranging terms, we get t is equal to 2 pi r over v. And we did have a formula for the orbital speed in the previous slide, which is equal to square root of gme over r. So we put that in, and we get this. Although it does have a fractional exponent, still a very important formula for the orbital period of a or circular orbit around Earth. I want you to solve these two problems in your notebook and I will we will check that in the next meeting. Okay, thank you.